Well, good afternoon and welcome to our midweek Bible study. We are going to be in Psalm 110 as we just charge through, plow through this wonderful book. I told a friend of mine today that if I was marooned on an island and I could only pick one book of the Bible, uh, I would have to go with the book of Psalms just because it, it, it takes you everywhere. Not only that, it's the largest uh, the most content in all of in, of all the books of the Bible, so you're going to get more scripture that way. But it just takes you from Genesis to Revelation. It covers uh, just it, it takes you all over, like a tour through the scriptures. And so here we are in in Psalm 110. And before we get started, I'm going to pray um, and uh, just bless this time together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the privilege to do this even online like this. And we thank you for those that are tuning in. We ask that you would bless them, that they would encounter you, your truth, your, your light, and that you would make their path straight. We ask that you would bless the Kenya team right now. Um, although us Mzungus aren't able to send our team on this end, we, we pray for those, the rest of the Kenyans and Ugandans that are going about the work anyway, uh, as they evangelize the village and um, see that this, that this new church be born in uh, just a few short weeks. So God bless them. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Got a little buzz back here. It's interesting. Okay, so Psalm 110 has actually been uh, referenced or quoted 27 times in the New Testament. So it's, it's the most prolific um, quotation and reference in, in, for sure, the book of Psalms, possibly the, the Old Testament, if I'm not mistaken. And it's verses 1, uh, well, verse 1, that we see the most quotations coming from. It's uh, upwards of 25 times that that verse is used again elsewhere in Scripture. And then down in verse 4, that's the second most quoted in this, in this chapter. And that's quoted four times. So um, a very popular, short, little psalm. And 
there's, for good reason. It's jam-packed full of theology, of, of insights about our Heavenly Father, about our Messiah. And so uh, let's just dive in together. It's a Psalm of David. We know that for two reasons. One, it says so. It's a Psalm of David. And also Jesus uh, affirmed that this was the Psalm of David in Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, 22, verses 41 through 46. And we're going to go there in just a second. But here we are with verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Okay. The Lord said to my Lord. Here we have, if you're Bible is edited like mine, you have capital L-O-R-D on that first Lord. And if you notice, the second Lord is just a capital L with lowercase letters following it. That means we got two different words here. And in the Hebrew, we have, uh, if, if, you, if you care to remember this sort of thing, um, Yehovah or Yahweh for that first word, Lord. And then we have Adon, um, which, which think Adonai. Right, uh, but that's an, a kind of a general word for that second Lord. For um, sometimes Moses is referred to, but but uh, many other people are referred to this. But it's just master, and it's a clear distinction between the greater versus the lesser, and that Lord being the greater. So we have we have uh, Jehovah or Yahweh saying something to one that is greater than David. David speaking of his master. And that's an interesting setup you got there in this little phrase. And Jesus brings this up to his Pharisees in the form of a question. So let's turn there. And this, I think, will, is the best commentary you can have on this verse. Matthew chapter 22, verse 41 is where we'll start. And we'll just read through to 46. This conversation Jesus having with the Pharisees. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? So it's interesting because now Jesus is actually posing a question to the Pharisees. Normally, we get it the other way around. The Pharisees are always trying to trip him up. They're trying to catch him in a trap. They're trying to find a way to get rid of him. And here Jesus is turning the tied and turning the scales on them and saying, you answer me this question. Whose son is he? They say to him, the son of David. And that is, that is a correct answer because we know that, that the lineage of David, it was promised in the Davidic covenant that the Messiah would come from David's lineage. So it is, a, the Messiah is a messianic Messiah for sure. But then Jesus challenged it because he's not asking about the, the um, he's not asking them about the lineage of the Messiah. He's asking them about the father of um, the Messiah, the rank of Messiah. And he takes them to Psalm 110. And he says to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord or Adon saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare to ask him anymore. And so Jesus is, is showing them their lack of understanding of the scriptures. And I, I was thinking about this um, as, as Jesus was growing up. I wonder how many times he refrained from correcting people um, when, when, when people referred to his father being Joseph. Uh, we, we do have an example of when he was in the temple and his, I think around his 12 year mark where he would be going to the temple for the first time when uh, they, they lost track of, of teenager Jesus and, and then he, he responded to them when they were kind of angry with him and found him and they were worried, mixture of, you know how a parent feels when they lose their kid, they're kind of like angry and 
terrified and scared. <laughs> and they, 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 they find him and they get past the scared part. Now he's safe. Now they're probably angry. Uh, that's what's left over. And he says, hey, w- wouldn't, you, wouldn't you know that I would be in my father's house? And so Jesus had an awareness, even from a young age, about who his, who his father was. You see, it was a virgin birth. And so Jesus was born of his heavenly father and Mary. That was a, a miraculous inception there, uh, conception. Heavenly father, God, and Mary. Joseph had nothing to do with it. And, uh, well, he had something to do with it because he took care of, um, as a, as a so called stepfather, I guess you would call him, and took care of Mary and didn't, didn't divorce her and, and, and um, leave her to be without a husband. So um, he was faithful in that. Um, and and um, that, was, that was wonderful of him. But, but Jesus, think about that. How many times was, did he refrain from having to correct people? He just kind of went along with it. People said, hey, your mom and dad, is that your mom and dad? And he was just like, well, that's not, that's not my dad, but uh, okay, yeah. Uh, and here, he's bringing a correction, quoting from Psalm 110, saying, hey guys, you don't, even, you don't know who my father is. You guys think it's Joseph, like everybody has, but my father is actually spoken of right here. His name's Yahweh, Yehovah. And David speaks of him and me in Psalm 110. And David clearly to, to, a, to a Jewish person, uh, the, the hierarchy is super important. Um, to, us, to us, we might we might kind of glaze over this, but when you say master or Lord, there is a clear, uh, that means a lot because there's a greater and a lesser. Um, we're all about equality and, you know, this whole idea of American independence and all this stuff kind of is, is a very different context. But this was very hierarchical, and um, this culture, it was very important who the greater and who the lesser was. And so, uh, thus, this verse is quoted many times to prove that Jesus is divine. And um, if anyone ever comes to your door, knocks on your door, and says that Jesus Christ is not God, then this might be a place that you would take them. You could take him to Matthew 22 and show them what Jesus said regarding his divinity. And then he says, um, oh, and, and by the way, if we're going to speak of this, um, of this verse, uh, before we move on, the Lord said to my Lord, now that, that, that was a, David had to have received that as a revelation because David wouldn't have been present when Jehovah or Yahweh is speaking to Messiah. That is a pre-incarnate Jesus and God conversation that, that somehow through um, miraculous revelation, David had got access to. But apart from that, we wouldn't even know that, that our Heavenly Father was speaking to Messiah in this way. And so the Holy Spirit is assumed in this role as David was, a, was anointed by the Spirit of God to be king. And he had a relationship with his God and his Messiah by faith um, and through the Holy Spirit, even this, this being revealed to him by the Spirit. So right here, you got the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, and, and, and David interacting with these um, three persons of the Godhead. And uh, I just find that to be uh, a wonderful, a wonderful thing right here in this, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six words here. The Lord said to my Lord, and then it says, sit at my right hand. Now that's an important word because sitting requires you to be done with your work, right? If you're sitting on the job, uh, that usually means that you're not doing your job. Sitting is, is, a, is a metaphor um, for your, the work being completed. And you, re, you recall what Jesus said on the cross. He said, it is finished. And so he is sitting at the right hand. 
And so this is looking forward to that work of Messiah being completed. And the Father saying to the Son, hey, come sit at my right hand. And we know that Jesus, that's exactly where he was headed. He was ascending to where? The right hand of the Father. Fulfilling this conversation, this call to, hey, come. The work is done. It's finished. Come sit by me. How long is Jesus going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father? Well, let's continue to read. Till I make your enemies your footstool. So there's a limited amount of time where this, where, where this sitting is going to happen. And then the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion and then rule in the midst of your enemies. So Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. But there's coming a day when our Heavenly Father is going to look to the Son and say, Go get your bride. It's time. And, um, and, you, and he's going to have a green light to do all that is on his heart. And we will continue to, to look at this passage about what exactly um, that is. But I just want you to know that, first of all, Christ is, is seated. The work is complete. And your faith in him is secure. It's done. It's finished. There's victory. And because of that, we can have peace. In the midst of storms, in the midst of trials, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of, of a culture going haywire or sideways, hey, we have a Messiah who's seated. And then there's coming a time where he's going to get up and he's going to act. It hasn't happened yet, but that doesn't mean it won't. So just as sure as he's seated, he is going to be standing and uh, mounting a horse. But we'll get there in a second. All right. The Lord said, I'm sorry, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. I want to just suggest the rod of your strength could, could possibly be capitalized as a name. The rod of your strength that the Lord is going to send Jesus Christ, Messiah, the rod of Jehovah's strength, of Yahweh's strength out of or into Zion. Jerusalem is the hub. It's the hub on the earth. It's the hub of the heavens meeting the earth. This is the center of the world. This is where the action is going to happen. And it's Messiah in Zion or in Jerusalem. That, that, the, that the strength of, of Jesus Christ is going to be manifested. And I would suggest to you that the strength of the Messiah is, um, is partly present with us right now to those who believe. And that's the power of the gospel for those that are being saved, those that are putting their faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel has been manifested. The gospel is able to save you. The good news, gospel just simply means good news. And what is that good news? That Jesus died for you and he rose again from the dead. And that whoever believes in him will be saved. That's the gospel. And that's the strength of God to save you, to save me from our sin. And the wage of sin, which would be eternal death. And then it says, rule in the midst of your enemies. Now, when I saw this, this verse here, there was a, there's another place in Scripture that, it, that many of us know quite well that have the words, in the midst of your enemies. What comes to your mind? Well, for me, it's Psalm 23 in verse 5, that he's doing something else in the midst of his enemies. And that would be, he sets a table in the midst of his enemies. Here, he's ruling in the midst of his enemies. That's, that's interesting to me, um, in the midst of your enemies, because what that means is that simultaneously it will be allowed that there will be enemies in the midst. <laughs> and yet he is ruling and he is able to make a table that we would dine with him. And I would suggest to you on that table, the centerpiece would be the, the, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Christ, the centerpiece of that meal. So in the midst of our enemies, 
he is ruling and he has set a table of fellowship for you and for me. Even if we're surrounded, even if there's trouble, even if there's enemies mocking, whatever they might be saying or doing, that's all right. He's ruling and he's made a table for you and for me. In verse 3, your people shall be volunteers. I like that. Volunteers. Now, sometimes you get voluntold to do something, but that's different than this. This is volunteering. And this, think of a, the free will offering. It's the offering that you would just say, you know what? I am just so thankful and grateful for the Lord. I'm just going to give a free will offering to the Lord today out of just the abundance of what God has given me. This is the new covenant. The new covenant is not one of obligation. It's not obligatory. It is a free will covenant. It is one that we volunteer, that we say, but I want to submit to you, Lord, but I want to serve you. Make me a bond servant. Even though you've set me free, put the all in my ear and drive it through the post. I'm yours. I want to be with you wherever you are. That's where I want to be. That's the new covenant. That's the church. The church are those who say, I want to, I want to be a volunteer for Messiah. And just the fact that we have been given that privilege, that we have been given the opportunity to be grafted in as a wild olive shoot to a, to a native olive root system and to be called um, uh, an olive tree when, when really we don't even belong on this thing. What a privilege us Gentiles have of being given the opportunity to even volunteer, right? Have you ever wanted to do something, but nobody asked, nobody even just asked you to, to volunteer for it? You, you're saying, hey, hey, I want to pick me, pick me. And you just didn't get picked. God's willing and able to use you if you would volunteer to be a part of his plan, his purpose, and trust in him. So his people will be volunteers. Um, not, only, not only is the church volunteers, but the nation of Israel. There's another layer to this. Now, remember when they said, um, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, the first time they said that, he came riding in on a colt that had never been ridden before to fulfill a, a, a very old prophecy that Messiah would enter Jerusalem on that very day. And they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, unfortunately, he had to, he had to, um, to say to them, ah, I've, I've, I've longed to gather you, Israel, like a mother hen under her wings, but you would not have me. They were saying it with their mouth, but their hearts, a week later, were saying, crucify him, crucify him. They didn't know him. They didn't recognize Messiah with their hearts. And as a nation, he's been rejected ever since. As a nation. There's Jews that, that are Messianic. Uh, I, I've met some and they're wonderful people. And, um, I'm always fascinated to, to um, talk to them. Uh, being a Messianic Jew is an, an interesting thing. They just really are a Christian that happens to be Jewish at that point. But um, a fascinating uh, conversation if you get a chance to to talk over some coffee or something with a Messianic Jew. But uh, there is coming a day where they are going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're going to mean it. You know why? Because Antichrist will turn from his, from his contract with Israel. He will break covenant with Israel. And he will seek to absolutely wipe them off the face of the earth during the seven years of tribulation. And at the end of that, Messiah, his second advent, his second coming is going to happen. And they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, because he will be saving them from basically annihilation from Antichrist, from the beast and his system in the desert. So uh, there is, they are going to be volunteering. That's my whole point in sharing that with you. They're going to be volunteering <laughs> To, to be Messiah's people at that time as a nation. In the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness, 
from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. In uh, the beauties of holiness, there's th- one of the things that happens when you, when you um, volunteer to follow and you put your trust in Jesus is he clothes you in his righteousness. He beautifies you. He sanctifies you. And he purifies you in this wonderful process of sanctification. And, uh, and that's what the church is, is, is to be up to that task, is to be preparing yourself for the wedding day. And then it says, from the womb of the morning. The womb of the morning. This morning, this idea of the sun coming up, the resurrection life. And you have the dew of your youth. Dew being, uh, these are kind of poetic terms, but dew being something that's fresh, something that's new every morning. Uh, it's, it's just the freshness. Have you ever woken up on a, on a morning and just dew covering everything that's sparkling in the sunlight? It's that vibrant, life, full of life dew. Um, and, and it's speaking of his youth, Messiah's youth, that being that perpetual freshness, that perpetual vitality in life that Messiah is going to, to have in his body. What a, what a wonderful sight that is going to be. And that's a good thing because if Jesus in his body is perpetually youthful and vibrant and full of life, we are going to receive bodies like his. He's the first to die and to raise again. We are going to follow suit. That means we are going to receive bodies like his, made to last. Uh, Paul talks about that wonderfully in his epistles. And I, uh, I just love going over those passages, thinking about the, these bodies that we're going to um, that, that are, we're going to receive, uh, what a wonderful, um, hope that we have ahead of us. Um, and then you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, there's a repetition here. Pay attention. The Lord has sworn. Well, the Lord doesn't need to swear. He just needs to say something. And it's as good as done. But if he swears, then he really means business. He's letting you know that I ain't changing my mind. And then if he says, I will not relent, after he just said, I have sworn, well, now he really, really means business. He's not going to change his mind. Absolutely, there's no way he's going to change his mind. And uh, that's, a good, that's a great thing because it's in our favor. The Lord has sworn he will not relent. You are a priest forever. That means Jesus is going to be a mediator for us forever. And it's never going to change. It's always going to be the case. He's going to be our advocate. We will always have somebody in authority, absolute authority in our corner, the one who died for us. And it's not going to change. God's not going to be like, ah, this plan's not really working out. Can you get rid of these guys? No. He has been incarnated, taken on flesh, died in our place. It's God's not going to relent. Jesus is going to be a priest forever. Hallelujah to that. And then it says, interestingly, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is a very obscure person, but he's given a very prominent role in Scripture. Um, in the, in the historical books where he pops, pops up there, just real briefly, just one time here in Psalm 110. This is quoted four other times in Scripture. Of course, in Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verses uh, 6 through 10, it's, uh, um, this, this is quoted and explained. But it's basically, to, to summarize, you know that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. And we know in the Jewish mind, Abraham, there isn't anyone greater than Abraham because he's the father of the nation. It's, that, was the, that was ground zero. That was the beginning of Israel is Abraham. And God's promise, his unconditional promise to Abraham. And yet, and yet, this mysterious priest named Melchizedek receives or gives a blessing to Abraham and receives a tithe. Therefore, he is greater than Abraham. And that's the priesthood. This mysterious, eternal priesthood 
that order, not the one of, of Aaron, because Aaron, they had to keep doing sacrifices, keep doing sacrifices year after year, after decade, after decade, after century. And it still didn't accomplish any final solution. But Melchizedek shows up once and it seems to be sufficient. <laughs> That's the order of Jesus. He shows up once, he does the work, he finishes it, and it's sufficient. Another thing to praise the Lord about. Messiah is sufficient. His work, what he did, is good. And it's going to be good forever. Verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. Now we transition here. We transition to, well, let's just face it. It's not a very quotable part of the psalm. We got 25 quotes from the first two verses, four quotes then from that next stanza. And then this part, I'm not aware of any place this is quoted. Because that we're dealing with wrath and we're dealing with judgment. But let's read it. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Meaning that he's, uh, from what I understand, that just he's going to be in a hurry. And he's not going to, he's just going to be just... Here's a brook. I'm going to grab some water and keep moving. Therefore, he shall lift up his head. He's going to be victorious. He's going to have quick execution of his justice. And um, you're not going to want to mess with Jesus when he comes in judgment, when he gets the green light from Yahweh to say, go get him. Do your thing. It's time. So he's king. He's judge, he's priest, he's Messiah. <clears throat> I want to just turn, have us turn to Revelation 19. I'm going to read, I know it's a big chunk, I'm going to read 16 verses here in Revelation 19 because I want to give you just a fresh picture of this judgment on display. And you can, you can continue to read through, you know, through the next chapter if you want on your own time. But I'm going to read starting in verse, chapter 19, verses 1 through, uh, through 16 there. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged her on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again, they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So this is speaking of the church here. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet and I, to worship him. But he said to me, hey, see that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So that's the group you want to be a part of. And then we see Jesus on the white horse. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had the name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then verse 17 through 21, if you want to read ahead there, it gets pretty gnarly. But we'll keep it light here for the kids. <laughs> so Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our priest, our king, our judge. And let me tell you, you don't want him to judge you based on your works. You don't want to be in that group. You want to be in the group that is covered by his grace, clothed in his righteousness, and his judgments pass over you by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, let's dive into Psalm 111 here. We're going to quickly go through these. These are wonderful Psalms, they're actually alphabetical acrostics. So uh, there's 22 letters in, in, in Hebrew, and each of the 22 letters have, um, have a line that follows after it, as an acrostic does. And this first one in, in uh, Psalm 111 says, Praise the Lord. I like that. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. With my whole heart. Now, that's something that we could preach to ourselves regularly because we need to remind ourselves he wants everything and we want to give him everything. The problem is actually doing that, giving him our whole heart. So there's areas of our lives that we need to continually be re-surrendering to him, that we need to be declaring, God, this part of my life is yours. This part of my life is yours. I want, I want to give it to you. I, and when I forgive me for taking any of it back, help me to lay it down afresh, every area of my life, my whole heart, my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. So we're supposed to be doing this together in a congregation. It's hard to do that when we're online. That's why we always encourage people, hey, come out on Sundays. Uh, get together as often as you can for fellowship with the saints. Um, it's barbecue season. The sun's out. It's technically it's summer now, right? So have a family over and, and, and spend time in fellowship. Spend time in, in prayer as you, around the table. Uh, this is what it's saying. I will praise the Lord. I will do it among the saints. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Oh, that's a great verse for a Bible student right there. Bible students, the, the works of the Lord are great and they're studied by all who have pleasure in them. Do you have pleasure in the works of God? Do you delight in what God has done, what he is doing and what he will do? Study it, know it, know him, and he'll make your path straight. Verse three, his work is honorable and glorious and his righteousness endures for a little while. No, it says forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. Now that verse right there is really the focus of this psalm. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He's not going to forget what he promised Abraham. Well, for that matter, what he promised Adam what he promised Noah, what he promised David, what he promised his church. These covenants that God makes, they're always on his mind. On the forefront of his mind is what he has said he's going to do. I like that. We'll see more of that at the end of this psalm. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity, truth, and justice, 
all his precepts are sure, or all of his laws are, are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Wow, just all these declarations of who God is. He's true. He's just. His precepts are sure. You can, you can stand on this firm foundation. In other words, he is amazing, right? Praise the Lord. Verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, that's a familiar verse. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Now, that's interesting because when we jump down to verse 1, praise the Lord, it starts off again in verse, I'm sorry, Psalm 112, verse 1, it says, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. We see that repetition just up in verse 10 of the previous psalm that we were just in, speaking of the fear of the Lord, and then speaking of the obedience of his precepts, the obedience of his commandments. You know, there's a relationship between the fear of the Lord and his commandments. And the best, um, it, it, they don't necessarily automatically jump out as being ob like an obvious connection, like fearing the Lord, what does that have to do with obeying his commandments? Like I'm supposed to be afraid that God's going to punish me, so I'm going to obey him out of obligation or out of fear of getting a spanking or something? Ah, I don't know if that... No, the relationship between fear and, and ob obedience to his commandments is faith. It's trusting in him. It's knowing his character and it's trusting in him. When you know him, you fear him. Because look, he's the one that can put a man or a woman and, and eternally separate himself from them, right? Anyone that can do that, that's actually pretty terrifying. There's a holy fear of God because he's God. And whatever he says goes. I'm, I am nothing compared to God. That's the beginning of wisdom, it says. You got to start there. You got to start with humility. You can't approach God like you're some equal to him. You got to approach God with humility and submission. And that's what fear the fear of the Lord is, it's a, it's, a, it's a beginning, it's a starting point in your relationship with Him. It's the beginning of wisdom. That's, that's where you start. And as you get to know God, you learn that when He says something, it's actually good. Because He's good. And everything that comes from Him is good. And, you, and you, that, starts, that pattern starts showing up over and over and over again. And you start going, well, you know what? Whenever I listen to what God says, well, it's... It's good. And the obedience is tied to that relationship with him that I trust him. Man, he's, he's done this and this and this. He showed himself faithful and true and righteous. Well, I should probably just trust him and obey him. And that's that relationship between the fear of the Lord and the obedience to him. It, it's all wrapped up in this idea of trust him. Trust in his nature and his character and his commands, what he says. That's all a command is. It's just what God says. It comes from his nature and his character. So if you like God, then you're going to like what he says, right? That's the idea. And we see that repetition at the end of Psalm 111, beginning in 112. And then in verse 2, it says of Psalm 112, His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. So this psalm is talking, it's it changed the focus from God, 111, to now 112, talking about those who follow him. Speaking of the blessings. So verse 3, wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. There that line is again. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteousness. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. 
He will not be afraid of evil tidings. Now, this is interesting. These, these lines here are talking about fear, but in a different way. Earlier, we were talking about the fear of the Lord. Now we're going to be talking about the negative kind of fear. Verse 7. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. Because why? He's, he fears the Lord. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid. Why is he going to not be afraid? Because he trusts in the Lord. He walks in his ways. Right? The fear of the Lord. Until he sees his desire upon his enemies. Notice that it's his enemies. It's not our enemies. The enemies of Jesus, he's the one that's going to bring wrath and judgment. But it's his enemies. Jesus' enemies. Messiah's enemies. He's made it so that we don't have any enemies. He's made it to where we are, we are to love even our enemies. What a remarkable thing that is. Now, let him deal with his enemies. Um, it may be that, that your enemy ends up being his enemy, but you never know. Because it could be one that changes their mind, repents, and puts their faith, and they become a brother or a sister in Christ. So, their, people's stories aren't done yet. Um, give them a chance. You never know who you might be talking to. You could be talking to a future brother or sister in Christ. They're just not there yet. So sometimes those who I found uh, who are seem to be most the, the furthest away from putting their trust in Christ are actually really close. Uh, they're just fighting really hard. But God's got them. God's going to get them. He's going to bring them in with his loving kindness and his mercy and his grace. And, and he, wants, he wants to use people like us to do that. So have patience, have kindness, and maybe you'll see opportunities to... Uh, to share his grace and his love, his gospel message. And then verse 9, finally, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor, the wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away, the desire of the wicked shall perish. These times are temporary times. The, the wicked will have their day and they will have their hour. But there's coming a time where our Heavenly Father will say, uh, it, you're done sitting. Stand up. Messiah, go get your bride and bring judgment and put all your enemies um, under your feet. And finally, he, the last enemy, death itself. So that, that will be... Well, there's a lot to look forward to. I wanted to sing this song um, as, we, as we close our time together. A few songs here, but this is his, a song that says, His love endures forever. That's a nice line from that last couple psalms there. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. Love endures forever For He is good, He is above all things His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Mighty hand With a mighty hand And an outstretched arm his love endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing setting sun 
His love endures forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, <coughs> sing praise, sing praise, oh, sing praise. Forever, God is faithful. Forever, God is strong. <coughs> Forever. God bless you.